Good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm David Barnard, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Man Manitoba. We're located here tonight on the original lands of Anishinaabeg, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward with, in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. My spirit name is Standing White Bear, and I'd like to introduce myself in this traditional way out of respect for the people of the land and their traditions and for the relationships that led to me having it. So welcome. I feel like I need to apologize a little bit for the space. So many of you are interested in the topic that we have a bit of a bowling alley feel here. Uh, so I hope that the sound reaches the back and we'll make sure that there are folks moving around to get, uh, get your questions and comments when we get to that part of the evening. It's great to see such a crowd. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a new location. We can accommodate the strong interest in this topic, although it's uh, in a slightly unusual shape. We're in the Alumni Association Agora, and we're welcoming a panel of three notable U of M alumni with many more joining us in the audience, I'm sure. This space serves as a meeting place for our Fort Garry campus community in this active living center that's been made possible by alumni like those of you who are here today. Our interconnectivity with others and the almost free communication that results is the context for a conversation about our roles as global citizens. In recent years, we've seen social movements begin with a few, then galvanize whole communities. Much of this is possible because of our unprecedented access to tools that allow the flow of information. Through social media, all of us now have the ability to transmit news from the moment it happens, becoming storytellers, truth seekers, and change makers. As the Tree of Life synagogue shootings in the United States this past Saturday remind us, the power of one and social media networks can be put to evil purposes as well. Perhaps more than ever before, we need to talk about uniting for positive change, about taking responsibility as individuals for making the world a better place, free of senseless violence, racism, and discrimination. Our university as a community is committed to the values of human rights, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I would ask that we would just take a moment of silence now with the events over the weekend so close to us to remember the Tree of Life victims and others who've lost their lives to injustice, hatred, and oppression. Thank you. In recent years, we've seen challenges to an international consensus that many of us have grown up with. Gersh and I were in Paris the night of the Brexit vote, and like many, were shocked at the undoing of something that seems such an important part of our shared experience. The United Nations Refugee Agency reported earlier this year that there are 68.5 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, with one person being forcibly displaced every two seconds as a result of conflict or persecution. In recent weeks, we've witnessed the formation of a migrant caravan moving north through Mexico toward the United States and the sometimes surprising, almost shocking responses to that. And we've seen how that phenomenon and other issues are shaping a conversation in the US that's surprising to many of us, no matter what our personal political inclinations might be. Tonight's visionary conversation, The Power of One, What's My Responsibility as a Global Citizen, is intended to encourage us to think critically about our roles as global citizens and whether we have the power to make a difference on both a local and international landscape. Can we empower ourselves as individuals in a globalized world, reaching across cultures to make a positive difference? I'm pleased to welcome three distinguished panelists who'll speak from their personal and professional experience working locally and abroad. First, we're honored to have with us someone who's dedicated her career to uncovering meaningful stories, people, and experiences from around the world, sharing them with Canadians on behalf of the CBC as a foreign correspondent. Nala Ayed is an award-winning journalist covering major world events from the refugee crisis unfolding across Europe 
to the disappearance of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. She spent nearly a decade in the Middle East, reporting in ways that broadened our knowledge of the complexities of a region that is largely misunderstood. Also with us this evening is Brenda Gunn, an associate professor in, the Ro in Robson Hall, our faculty of law at the University of Manitoba. Brenda combines academic research with activism, pushing for greater recognition of indigenous people's inherent rights as determined by their own legal traditions. She took this perspective and expertise to the United Nations, where she helped develop materials to understand and implement the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Brenda's current research focuses on promoting greater conformity between international law on the rights of Indigenous people and domestic law. Our third panelist has spent her 25-year career championing women and underrepresented talent in the film industry as an Emmy Award-winning media executive and producer. Laura Michael Chishin has co-founded Sundance Productions with Robert Redford and has used the medium of film and television to give a voice to marginalized groups with bold, distinct content. From documenting the impact of Russia's anti-gay propaganda laws on queer athletes during the Sochi Olympics to the CNN series Death Row Stories, Laura leads the film industry with sharp, thought-provoking content that challenges the status quo and asks us to think critically about the world we live in. We also have in our audience tonight many members of our community familiar with the issues under discussion. We have also uh, recipients of the Nala Ayad Prize for Student Leadership and Global Citizenship. And I want to welcome the many members of our university community with us today, including Mr. John Kiersey, Vice President External, Mr. Jeff Lieberman, Chair of the University's Board of Governors, Mr. Carl Newman, President of the University of Manitoba Graduate Students Association, Dr. Joanne Kesselman, Vice President Emeritus, and also joining us today, some of our esteemed honorary degree recipients, the Honorable Dr. Janice G. Johnson, the Honorable Dr. Otto Lang, Dr. Marjorie Blankstein, Dr. Arthur Defer, Dr. Yuda Henteleff, and of course, Dr. Nala Ayed, one of our panelists this evening. And I want to extend a special welcome to the families and friends of our panelists here today who've come to be part of this important conversation. So our format, for this evening will be this. First, each of the panelists will make short opening statements. Second, I'll pose a few questions to them. And then third, I'll look to you for comments and further questions. There are individuals with wireless microphones circulating for this purpose. We'll try to wrap things up by about 8.30 with a reception to follow. Okay, let's begin. So I will ask each of the panelists to please take a few minutes to share your experiences that connect with our topic of global citizenship and the power we each have to affect social change. Nola? Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction and it's really great to be here. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to begin by telling a story that begins with a, an email that I received a few years ago. And it was a bit of an odd email because um, it was asking me to lend my name to a, a prize on global citizenship. It was from Tony Roge, who was the um, head of the International Student Center until recently. And he wrote me out of the blue and he was quite excited about the idea. And so he asked me to think about it. And at first I thought that it would be actually rather vain of me to accept having an award named after me, sort of a mid-career journalist, when there are people like Lise Doucette and Louise Arbour around. Um, and my second thought was, and this was told to me by somebody I met last night, is that awards are normally not named after people who are still alive. <laughs> Nevertheless, I told Tony that I would listen to his argument, and he explained that the values that this prize would support would be values that supposedly I would share. And so he said that it would provide an opportunity to support and reward students whose actions are helping bridge the local with the global. Um, and not just where problems are concerned, but also where solutions are concerned. Now, from my privileged position, it is a very privileged position, the, the kind of work that I do, I've always believed in the interconnectedness of the world and the interdependence of the world. Um, and I've always talked a lot, it's kind of what I do, um, about and advocated you know, the importance of being global citizens in this world and the importance of that role. But I haven't done much about it. And here was a chance that was being handed to me to actually do something about it. So I did buy in. 
And the very first Nala Ayad Prize, it still sounds funny, for student leadership and global citizenship was given out back in 2010, in fact. So it's been eight years. And as the president mentioned, some of the previous winners are actually in this audience right now. And I think if you look at their accomplishments, that they provide an excellent inspiration um, for the power of, of what we could think of as the power of one to make global change. So I just want to mention a, a couple of them specifically. One is uh, Anamika Anwisha, who developed the program to reintegrate child soldiers in Uganda and with a local NGO, and who actually has worked in Winnipeg on peacekeeping, uh, sorry, peace building initiatives. There's also Mariam Alazazi, who's involved in um, Stronger Together Manitoba Project. She helped welcome Syrian refugees when they came to this province. She also volunteers with Respiratory Therapists Without Borders. And then there's Peter Karari, uh, who is one of the first, in fact, he was uh, the first recipient of the award. He's now a world-renowned researcher into conflict and political, uh, political violence and organized crime, and he's worked extensively with the poor in Kenya. Now, their collective work demonstrates that there's no right way, there's no right place to be a global citizen. And they're also all proof that the ways in which we can act globally are in fact as numerous as, the, as there are people in this world. In my thinking, being a global citizen, in my mind, is actually a way of thinking. It's a way of living. It's not so much something that you do necessarily, but it's something that you are. It's seeing yourself as part of a greater whole and part of the problems, but also part of the solutions. And often that does eventually mean that you have to give something substantial of yourself, something essential of yourself, and sharing it with the rest of the world to try to find solutions to what are huge problems. And because of what I do, I've been very lucky to meet Canadians and others, of course, who meet that definition, that, that very broad definition of what a global citizen is. So I want to mention one other person that comes to mind when I think of that kind of example, and his name is Jamil Giovanni. He's, uh, maybe some of you have heard of him, he's a Toronto lawyer, a young man who grew up in a very tough neighborhood and who found his renaissance only when he realized that he could buy a gun at will on the streets. He decided to go to law school and ended up becoming a community worker and working with police to explain what it's like for a black person to be walking down the street to get racially profiled. And then the Paris attacks happened. And he decided it was also part of his role to, to understand what motivates young men to turn to violence. And so he decided to up and move from Toronto, go to Belgium, live in Molenbeek, where some of those guys came from, spend months there trying to understand the context, went to Paris, then to Egypt, then to Nairobi, and came back to Canada and wrote a book called Why Young Men? And so now he spends his time helping the rest of us understand why and how across cultures, across places all around the world, men, young men sometimes turn to gang-related or extremist violence. So not everyone, of course, has the kind of luxury um, to be able to go and travel around the world to do good. But what we can all do, and it's part of what Jamil did and everybody else I mentioned tonight, is to become, to, to seek out information about what is happening around our world. And so since that's partly my business, that is what I do, is impart information, I'm gonna end with just a few words on the importance and the power of being informed. First of all, obviously, it's well within everyone's reach and certainly more so with the internet. And just by knowing what is happening beyond our borders can change, can actually bring about change, as you well know. How well information changes how you act, what you buy, how you vote, how your friends look at you, what you tell your neighbors, your children, all of that can help bring about change. And yes, eventually, sometimes, and hopefully more often, it actually compels and motivates people to do extraordinary things like Jamil and the others I mentioned. But it does begin with being informed. I'm a little bit biased, but that's my starting point. So it's a natural starting point and to being a good global citizen, and I believe everything else flows, flows from that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here in our little bowling alley. And I can also see people climbing a rock wall behind all of you. So if I look somewhat distracted, there's some very capable young women climbing 
a wall back there. Um, I'm very excited to be here and on part of this panel and our conversations leading up to it. I think we all got pretty revved up and excited. Hours. <laughs> hours, we may never get through. Um, but when I was asked to be on the panel, I was very excited about the opportunity. And as I started trying to think about what would I say about the power of one, it kind of escaped me. And if you ask my fellow, so I've been thinking about this up until sort of now, trying to think about, well, what do I have to say? What do I have to offer on this panel or to this audience? And I realized that I, the only place I could start is the place that I know. And so um, I'm a Métis woman. My dad's family is from just north of Winnipeg. My mom is Mennonite from just south of uh, Winnipeg. And I'm really proud of who I am, and I'm very happy that I get to be a professor in my home territory. It's an honor that not a lot of professors um, are able to have. And so when I'm thinking about this question about the power of one, my starting place is to think about, well, what are our responsibilities and what have I been told and taught are my responsibilities? And so where do I go to think about this? But the elders that have helped me along the way. And so Elder Bone, who is an elder that's worked uh, very closely with the University of Manitoba, also one of our honorary degree recipients, he will always say that our first responsibility is to know who we are. And so I continue to explore that and to understand what does it mean to be a Métis woman with a Cree spouse and a baby along the way in a per professor in this university um, in this globalized world. Um, I think it's our responsibility to know our history, to understand the issues that are facing Canada, but also the world. And I think that's always my sort of starting point is I start very local. What are, what are our uh, issues here? What do we need to know and then work out from there? And so if we're here in Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory, the homeland of the Métis people, our responsibility is to know and understand the treaties, which when I talk to the elders, they say the treaties were about caring for one another and caring for Mother Earth. Elder Darcy Linklater, who's um, a Nihitho elder from um, uh, Northern Manitoba, he talks about Wakotwin or relationship is very important to our people. And at the time of treaty making, the queen adopted us as her children to protect us and to take care of us. According to our people, the establishment of kinship is, journey, is to journey with one heartbeat, one body and one mind, as long as the waters flow. And so that's my responsibility. And trying to think about how to live that every day is the challenge that I uh, try to take on most days. And so as noted in the introduction, my work has focused a lot on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And when I think about our responsibilities and the role of the UN Declaration in helping us in this globalized world, I think about one of the sentences in the UN Declaration that talks about the importance of recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples. And I think in Canada, we talk about reconciliation and trying to mend relationships. And the UN Declaration, I think, is really helpful in how it tells us that if we want to work towards reconciliation, we have to start by recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples. That contrary to what a lot of people think, that if we recognize special rights for special people, that it's going to tear countries like Canada apart, the UN actually says, no, it's convinced that by recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples that we actually begin the process of working together and shifting the relationship to one of mutual respect and understanding. And so if those are my responsibilities, then my, <laughs> my next question was, well, where does my power to act come from? And you know, it comes from my family. It comes from a spouse who stands by me even when I'm traveling every other week and <laughs> going crazy and, um, you know, taking on a little bit too much work. You know, having um, my family, having all my relations. I have a lot of family in Manitoba here 
that continue to support, support me. My power comes from my community, comes from um, my Métis community and knowing who I am. And I think one of the challenges I had in answering this question, the power of one, I realized that one of my stumbling blocks is I spend most of my time thinking about collective action and promoting greater recognition of collective rights. And so it was a bit of a sort of moment in time that I had to stop and think, well, what is the power of one? I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that sort of individualized approach because I spend so much time focusing on collective action. And so um, I think it is an important question, um, but one that I think I come to from a slightly um, another direction. And I think finally on the sort of challenge of the power of one is I'm constantly struggling with the idea of what is the power of an individual to address systemic problems? And how does individual action feed into larger change in our society? And so uh, I think that's as far as I was able to get to answer the question at this point. Um. Right. I'm honored to be on this very prestigious panel, uh, and it's great to be home. I'm a Winnipegger. I graduated. I had to get an email to tell me what year I graduated, and it's embarrassingly a long time ago, 1989. Um, and it's an honor to be here and back at U of M. I remember taking the Pamela Highway bus from Crescentwood with my sister every day, barely making the 9 or 9.30 classes, running through campus, and remembering indelibly how much this university affected me. Um, so thank you all for being here. And I thanks to my family, extended family, friends, cheerleaders, and some alma mater as well. I'm, I'm thrilled to see everyone. So I left um, Winnipeg when I was 21 because I was brought up in a university, in a family, in a school system that said to me, you are a global person, you can go anywhere and you can do anything. And I have to say, I give credit to my education, to my family and to the world that Winnipeg brought to me. I, I never assumed I couldn't move to the south of France, move to Toronto, do an MBA, move to New York and run channels and create a production company because I was taught that the power of one is to say, yes, I will, and yes, I can. And I give Winnipeg, my hometown, a lot of credit for instilling that in me where I now realize I didn't even think anything other than that. Very global perspective on a very small individual. Um, I, I think what's very interesting about the work I do is I'm a storyteller. I tell stories with very, very powerful and, and prominent mediums, whether it's television, the internet, I make stuff for you know, Netflix, I make projects for CNN. I take that responsibility very seriously. And what I've learned through my career in media is that it just takes one story, it takes one person sharing his, her, their story to make positive change. So thinking about the power of one over the last couple of weeks, really I thought like, look at the leaders in our world who have made change that have an indelible and everlasting effect. I've had the you know, brilliant opportunity and I'm very grateful to have worked with some great leaders here in Winnipeg. One of my former bosses, Susan Milliken is here, Robert Redford. I've worked with women who have mentored and given me huge pathways to my success. I've had family. And the one thing that I've always, always searched for is truth, truth and justice. And when I went and, and was being interviewed in the US, I had no idea I was gonna to move to live in New York. I was a kid from Winnipeg and it just, these opportunities and pathways kept opening up. But the one belief I had is that truth and justice will prevail. And that is the power of one. If one person speaks truth to power, there is a ripple that will change, that can possibly change the world. And now that I'm in the US and obsessed right now, frankly, with what's happening with our country, demoralized, um, you know, depressed, but, but on the other hand, also energized because what's happened, not just in the US, but what's happened in places like Brazil where they've just elected a very, very right-wing leader where, you know, who knows what that country is gonna you know, foresee in the near future. In countries all around the world where injustice is happening, I feel a responsibility and I feel that it is a, a huge honor to be able to tell stories. 
I also work with collaborators um, who frankly have not necessarily had their stories told. So I work with a lot of women, women directors, women producers, women filmmakers. I work with a lot of LGBTQ community members. One of my filmmakers, Noam Gonick, is here tonight. We made the To Russia With Love story together. It was a huge honor to tell that story. I've made documentaries on artists, politicians, and people who, the one collective similarity among them all is that they've created positive change. And that, to me, is you can be a person like I was in the middle of Winnipeg who had no idea where her career might take her, but by telling the truth and searching for those in stories, I would be able to help hopefully one day help shift some ideas in this world. Um, another, another point I think of, of this collective community, and look at 400 people have shown up on an evening where we thought there might be one or 200, so thank you, is that we all yearn, we all yearn for a more positive inspired being, whether it's Aboriginal, Indigenous people's rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, people who are immigrants, people who are seeking social justice, we all seek that in our lives, in our work, and in who we are. And I believe in light, I really do. Many people have asked me, what do you do for a living? And I use the Andy Warhol phrase, famous phrase, he says, I do social work. <laughs> Happens that my father, Joe, is a social worker. But if you think about that, we all do social work in a way. And, and it's very much what Nala and Brenda have said, that it is also a presence of the way we live. And if you live in a positive manner, it reflects well on you and the rest of the world. Um, I'm also a huge, I will just say, um, believer that local representation evolves into massive national and international representation. I've learned that the hard way. I became an American citizen in 2016, proudly keeping my Canadian citizenship, but thinking, we would have the first female president in 2016. I got my citizenship specifically to vote that November. I wasn't active in the way that I should have been, but I was like, everyone's voting this way, correct? We all thought we were. We went to the polls. We all went to screening parties, assuming we were gonna be celebrating the first female president of the United States. That hit us all in the head, those of us who voted for Hillary Clinton. And that was a wake up call November 7th, that the collective action of individuals working together actually had more power than any of us understood. The negative, the hate, you know, the dialogue of this current president actually motivated not one or two people, it motivated huge population. But what we're seeing, and in one week's time, my obsession is November 6th, is the fact that we're hoping we can make some change, positive change. And I realized I've knocked on doors, I've sat in phone booth banks, you know, for various candidates. I have a home in the Catskills, which is very much like Portage La Prairie or Brandon. And I've knocked on a lot of doors these last few weeks because I believe that the power of community and the power of those of us when we gather together is much stronger if it's towards positive action. So I just wanna read, I'm gonna read one thing. I, I created with an amazing director, Don Porter, a series on Netflix around the story of Robert Kennedy. It was um, premiered on Netflix in April in time for the tragic 50th anniversary of his death. We looked at his life and his legacy and thought this was a progressive leader that had he lived could have been even more powerful than many of the leaders today. So just, I'm gonna leave with this comment. This was, I'm gonna paraphrase his quote. This is from June 6, 1966. He gave this speech in Cape Town during apartheid, the time of apartheid. Each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of another or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each of these ripples from a diff million different centers of energy and daring those ripples to build a current which can sweep down the mightiest of walls of oppression and resistance. This is my dream. So if we can all take the ripple of hope idea, that is, I think, something that I'm living every day. And, and I'm just thrilled, thank you, to be here. Well, I'd like to thank you all for being here on behalf of everyone in the audience. And uh, I'm a little stunned that um, you read that, uh, that quotation because earlier in the day, 
uh, I was looking at possibly including that myself in tonight's <laughs> remarks. <laughs> but I'm glad you used it. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we'll, we'll go to the audience. Uh, social media have really changed the way we, we can interact uh, with respect to uh, social issues and the power that we exercise. And sometimes it might be possible to do something easy, like add our name to a list uh, on uh, electronic media, uh, but then to walk away from any other kind of engagement. Or sometimes people really get uh, actively engaged and social media can, can have an impact that way. I just, I wonder from your perspective, how do you think that, um, that social media could really help us empower others or empower ourselves, or are we, are we fooling ourselves when we think that those, that those, uh, those tools actually have an impact? What's your perspective on that? Well, I, I think, I mean, you have all heard of clicktivism or slacktivism, like slacker and activism put together. Um, and it is, I think, a great concern that, that maybe people click, like, and they think that they've done something, they've accomplished something. But I think it's also kind of a, an underrated way to introduce people to the idea of activism, especially young people. And so if it happens on social media, I think it is an underrated way uh, and, a, and a beginning for someone to get involved in activism. Also, there are organizations, which I'm sure you've heard of, some of which have only been around for a few years, that actually marshal, I mean, they claim to have millions of members because of the fact of the way they can reach them through social media. And they marshal those numbers, which were unprecedented 10 or 15 years ago, in terms of directing their own activism, you know, the, the, the offline activism. And so they will get their members to vote on what issues are important to them. And then they will act on those by using petitions or lobbying politicians or doing some of these other things. So I think in, in a way, it's a great gateway, at least, to get the voices of ordinary people to organizations who are still engaged in normal activism. And the last one I will say is that um, the Me Too movement was a great um, uh, example of where clicking and just saying, I believe her, actually did make a difference, a massive difference. And it probably is one of the biggest global kind of efforts that we've seen that has engaged social media of all kinds. And so the very simple act, the very rudimentary act of clicking yes I like this, or I believe her, actually helped thousands of young men and women and older young men and women to come out and tell their stories, which also encouraged others to tell their stories. So that's my perspective. Exactly. The, I think in the U.S. particularly, there, there are such extremes. We're, we're feeling that every day, you know, the, the, the argument and the rhetoric and the negativity. The positive is I look at Black Lives Matter, the Women's March, um, you know, after the tragic shooting, the, the Parkland students, those have really been communities activated by social media and showing up, you know, march for our lives across the world in support of gun control, gun legislation. So if used in for positive, it, it's very, it, 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 it can be a very, very, very important tool. There's a lot of important work being done by people who frankly can't afford to build offices and have overhead and pay for administration. So it's a collective community around the world. You know, you look at Arab Spring, there are many, many movements that have been, I think, the beneficiaries of social media. You just have to control the use of it. I'm a guilty party of like at 2.30 in the morning, you know, my husband is like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just on Twitter. So that is, I mean, I, I recognize the the addictive nature of it, but I feel like if used in a positive manner, and I think we have to hold the social media platforms accountable, and that's happening now. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they're all actually being called to the table to talk about what are they doing to help eliminate hate and negativity and rampant you know, lying and, and wrongful information dissemination. So I think that is equally important. And I'm glad you told that uh, story about, uh, you know, using your device at uh, an hour when your spouse is asking you questions, because I'm sure that nobody else in this room has had that experience. <laughs> so it's interesting to know that it exists out there. Brenda, do you want to? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that one of the powers I think that exists in social media is while we often think it shortens the news cycle, one of the things that I notice at least sort of in my various feeds is how it can lengthen the cycle. So um, stories that seem to just keep getting shared. 
And so when issues come up, one of the most recent ones on my Facebook was um, the story of Grassy Narrows and the mercury poisoning and that the community has been fighting for 40 years trying to get the government to recognize. And it just seems every sort of few weeks, every few months, the story keeps coming back up. People will just reshare. And it's a way to actually make sure that issues don't fall off the radar, right? So I think it actually can be a powerful way to keep our consciousness open to various issues when there's so much happening. It's a really powerful way for people to say, no, but just just because Chief Forbisher passed away doesn't mean that we're gonna stop trying to hold Ontario accountable, for example, right? Like a very small local example. And so I see that happening regularly. Thank you. We live in Canada in a relatively stable and safe environment. We certainly have some inequities that need to be addressed. But when we look outside and think about, uh, as Canadians looking at citizenship in the, in the larger global community, how can we respond in an effective, useful way to an increasingly unsettled world? Um, I, every day we can respond. And I think it is, it is that local, how do, we, how do you move around your, your local, you know, with your town, your community? I mean, I've now learned the hard way every community, you know, voting, whether it's for town council, mayoral races, um, you know, teachers, presidents, et cetera, you know, it is important. All the guilds and service organizations that so many people in this room have taken part in are all incredibly important. And I feel like first you act locally and you think globally, and that is a, a cliche, but it actually, when you think about it, it is not. It works and it matters. You know, currently I'm making a film which I can't divulge too much about, but I'm producing a film with a great director, Don Porter, and we're traveling with various candidates in the U.S. midterm elections, which are next Tuesday, November 6th. And it's amazing to me, some of these candidates who, by the way, for the first time ever, more women are running than ever before in every level, House, Congress, local representation, more indigenous, African-American, people of color, diversity. We have over 50% of the candidates are either women, person of color, Native American, um, African-American, which has never happened in the US. That says to me that on every level of government, after these last few years of unrest in, our, in, in the US, people are engaged. And I've never before heard that the pre-voting that's happened, advanced voting, which has now been in three or four weeks around the country, in some, in some of the polling areas, there's more people who voted in advance in early voting than has ever voted ever in that community. So it just says to me, on every level, people are engaged and showing up and on both sides, you know, making their making their mark by voting. And I, I feel that's the only way we're gonna have any kind of change in this world is by just showing up, frankly. That there are, there's a variety of ways to, to engage. That that and I think you all know this. That there are things that we can't only accomplish with with as you say with large groups doing things diligently. And for example, where it comes to climate change or the environment or um, you know alleviating poverty, but then being inspired by those kinds of actions that are way out there and another level. Where for example, a British surgeon who volunteered his time by talking on Skype and WhatsApp, helping surgeons in Aleppo in Syria actually conduct live surgeries from his home in Britain. So that's those are two extremes. And then there's stuff in the middle where you have volunteers who edit Wikipedia to add you know, win more women and people of diverse backgrounds to, to enrich that body of, of public knowledge that's out there. There are people who are sitting in this audience who started a theater um, called Sawa Theatre that brings together Canadians and newcomers to have conversation and friendship that's acting locally. So there are so many ways you can do uh, things here or elsewhere that you, to advance, I guess, the cause of global citizenship. And I think um, as the world is increasingly globalized, there's ways that we can also remind ourselves that we are connected and potentially implicated in the issues that we think are quite removed from us. 
So you mentioned the um, migration that's happening from Honduras. And I remember when I was working in Guatemala, you know, we were told by multiple people that it is not safe to be Canadian in Guatemala, that the devastation that Canadian mining companies are engaged and the activities that they're engaging in in Guatemala meant that um, as a Canadian, I would be seen at fault and responsible for those actions. And so I think one of the stories that hasn't always come out in this migration is, again, we have Canadian mining companies in Honduras that are engaging in activities that are forcing some of that relocation out. So even though sometimes the issues may feel distant from us, I think as we learn more about them and think about our responsibilities, is how are our actions here actually having impacts in other ways and then stepping up with our responsibility and trying to take action then to uh, address those concerns. One last question from me. We, we here at the University of Manitoba, and I think every university, wants to see itself as a constructive agent of change in society. You've all been in one way or another, uh, sometimes more than one, uh, involved in the community. What, uh, what advice might you give or what perspective might you have on how could we as a university and as its various members um, have, uh, have an impact as constructive change agents? Sure. Should I start with this one? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a really great question. Um, and I, I feel like I have an over, overly simplistic answer, which is how universities can help create critical thinkers, right? That we don't need to give a lot of answers, but I do hope that the people coming out of our institution are able to take all the information that exists out there, and sometimes it's an overwhelming amount and be able to start working their way through and critically engage with that information so that then they can decide for themselves how they're going to be involved. What I'd like to say on this is that I, again, from a very privileged um, point of view that I have kind of looking at a number of different places around the world, I feel that there are a number of debates that are going on right now that don't really have a home, that, that are outside the traditional sort of government voter conversation. And they need, a, they need a home. Those debates need a home. I'm talking about things like the ethical consequences of like an, the intersection of biotechnology and information technology. Or what is the next big political movement in the world? What's that going to look like? Or perhaps, you know, how do you regulate huge, bi or huge, huge technology companies? And what does that do for our right to privacy, but also, you know, the, our ability to access information. So those kinds of conversations, I think, need to happen in institutions like the University of Manitoba, where, again, they're important, they're global in scope, but there's nowhere really to have those conversations for ordinary people. Thank you. Um, I, I think being open to the most diverse group of students and faculty is, I mean, when I come back to campus, this campus, any campus, I, I'm filled with um, hope, and I feel it is a global center. Every campus that I have been on or had the privilege of going to school at feels like a safe epicenter for thought, for ideas, for exchange of cultural, um, you know, new cultures. And I feel like that is, it has to be a very open environment and diversity and support of students who not necessarily, who necessarily have not had the privilege I feel I've had is also essential. I met some of the most incredible human beings during my university years in, in both Toronto and Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Toronto, and feel and that those friendships, um, they've been lifelong, and they've also created a, a group of, and web of support internationally that will never break. And, and that is a special experience that only a university campus and experience can bring if the university has left a very, very wide open um, sphere and web of students who are coming in. So I love being on campus and seeing all of the change because I think it's all positive. Thank you, I appreciate the answer to that question. I, I, um, uh, I've often remarked that I'm the first person in my family to go to university and because of the various things you, you've said, my children then chime in and yes, and you never left. <laughs> it's just, a, it's a great place to be. Thank you very much. And now uh, I look for questions and or comments from uh, members of the audience, if you would like to raise your hand, uh, if you have something to contribute, there are people moving around with microphones and we'll try to get a microphone to you. 
exercise while we're waiting. Sure. Well, just do, okay. Nala's just going to put in a plug while we're waiting. Sorry. But the one thing I was going to add is the other thing university can do is make it possible for prizes like the Nala Ed mm. Prize to exist. And that if you will indulge me, I'd like to invite you to consider supporting this prize because you'd be supporting students who are leading on the leading edge of trying to be a good global citizen. So, and it's also um, tax deductible, I understand. So, <laughs> so please think about it. Thank you. <laughs> kind of goes to a point that uh, you brought up during the evening. It's like uh, in the 80s, the US government broke its own laws to destabilize Nicaragua selling arms. And then in the uh, 90s, you had the US export uh, criminals from California to Central America that's results in some of the violence there. And it's kind of like, uh, um, but when we watch the news, right, we just see, uh, um, we see a lot, we see more of Trump than we see about education. And my question is, like, how can we as consumers um, encourage the media to educate us as opposed to entertain us, especially our news organizations? I think I've, I feel compelled to, 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 to answer that question. I think by asking that question, I think it's important to bring it to the attention of to the news media. And as we've discussed earlier, there are more ways than one to, for all of us to reach each other. And I think it's important to remind organizations that there's more to the world than Donald Trump. And there's more to the world that's good and bad than Donald Trump and that we need to hear about those parts of the world. And I have to say this, and this is a public forum that, as someone who's not working in the U.S., I'd really like you to say that often. <laughs> oh, I'll just add too. I think, and I think that is an exactly perfect point because it's happened now after this horrible week in the U.S. There was, you know, this the the shooting in Pittsburgh. There's a shooting in Kentucky, the pipe bombs going to a number of prominent officials on the Democratic side. Um, what you're seeing is the public saying enough of the negative support and the baiting of some of number four. I, I won't name him. There's a number of us who won't name him, but of number 45's policies and continually giving him airtime. Do not, we don't want to see those rallies. We don't, we're not interested in his speeches that he sort of self-proclaims and lies. So there is, there's a huge movement of people who are saying, we're not gonna listen, we're not gonna watch, and we, we're gonna shut off that news media. But it's interesting, I flew last night, and I have, because I'm in film and television, not as prominently as Nala, but I always look to see what people are watching on the little, you know, the little screens in, in the planes. And it was interesting, last night, a lot of people had the news on coming from Minneapolis or from New York, Minneapolis. And it would, I would say it was like 20% Fox, 50% CNN, and then 30% like movies and TV shows. So it's just interesting to see what people are consuming as they're like flying to another place. And that's different from about nine months ago when I actually would see almost 50-50 Fox, CNN. So interesting that I think people are starting to go, you know what? We're, we're, gonna, we're just gonna switch to some different views. And I watch both, by the way. I think it's important to understand both sides. I, I really believe it. So I do think it's important to understand it, but it's just interesting to see what's happening. I think people saying like, I want a diversity of opinion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions at the back? Uh, my question is just in relation to the university's role in providing global citizenship. So uh, I live very close to the university. It's really easy for me to get here, but I did grow up in northern Manitoba. And when I look at voting um, patterns, we'll go in North America, there's probably other places in the world, England and Brexit. If you kind of look at uh, metropolitan areas, generally have universities, they have the ability to have these conversations. Uh, rural and remote places, it's more difficult to do that. You might not have the most uh, diverse views just because why do people want to, there's not the economy up there for people to move. So how can the universities and colleges uh, carry that conversation to those rural communities, remote communities, northern communities, so that we're hitting a more diverse population outside of the metropolitan area? Mm, great question. Um, this is where technology, I think, really can be our friend. Um, I've had the opportunity to give continuing legal education seminars up north with not having left Winnipeg. 
right? So it was easy for the Bar Association in the Northwest Territories to open up a classroom and have the lawyers from the local bar attend. And, and you can sort of then engage that conversation without anyone having to spend money to fly without me needing to think about how does it work in the schedule. I think in some disciplines, we're challenged to think about how can education be offered remotely? Law is one of the examples where we think everyone needs to be in the classroom. And I was sort of trained in that tradition and I teach in that tradition, but recognize that that creates a real gap. And we have no university in Northern Canada, right? So right now there's no university in the territories. That's a huge gap, right? And so it is a challenge. There are people that are trying to take sort of program by program and offer it in northern this northern community. We have University College of the North that I think is trying to do some really interesting things in northern Manitoba, but it's definitely a challenge. And I think for a lot of us, the solution lies in embracing technology a little bit more and trying to think about how to harness some of those opportunities to, uh, to get the word out. And then having more of us willing to go up north for periods of time to engage. So bringing the education up north and thinking about how do you need to deliver information in a slightly uh, more culturally appropriate context, but also sort of working to bring people up to have those conversations and spaces. Thank you. Uh, I see another question at the back. Yeah, like, oh, good. Uh, as an aging uh, baby boomer in the uh, now early 21st century, right? Okay, there we are. Uh, I find myself frequently thinking about what seems to me to be some kind of collective uh, concerning uh, what has happened, uh, like, uh, you know, I guess in the, in the late 20th century. Uh, we, we are, of course, aware very much of what happened in the United States because of the dominance of our media by American media, of course. Um, one thing that I really do appreciate is, uh, is uh, the Canadian Minute that shows up on CBC every once in a while. And one of them dealt with Marshall McLuhan. And uh, Marshall McLuhan, of course, is one of the uh, intellectual pillars uh, of, of our, of our uh, society in his recognition that the of the importance of media i'm wondering whether or not any of uh, any of the speakers here have any particular comments concerning uh uh whether or not the the dominance now of internet and electronic media uh, what impact are they having on on our society uh, we have talked or they have talked a bit about how the uh the media have uh potential for wonderful uh, positive change, uh, but I'm wondering what uh, their concerns are uh, with respect to the negative use of media, at least what we seem to be facing perhaps in the next American uh, election. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that's a very good point, and I think I agree completely that there's been much influence. Um, for instance, I, I think we all have to sit down and read a book more often. I, I tend to be an information and news junkie and I need to take breaks. I think what's happening though is that there is a generation and I wanna shout out, I believe it'll be the 20, the 18 to 30 year olds and 35 year olds who are going to make change. There's been tons of research that say, even though that age, you know, the millennials, are very social media savvy and they're on devices. They also care differently about some of the issues that maybe some of the older population, money, wealth, um, possessions, you know, things that frankly, I think if you were born in the 40s, 50s, that accumulation mattered. We were taught, you know, people were taught that was important. I think there's a whole generation that have been born in the 80s and 90s that look and go, no thanks, it's about a different social good. And even though they're the most, I think, stimulated by social media and most engaged, they also have a different set of values. Every millennial I know, frank, frankly, is cares about completely different things. They care about social justice, women's rights, immigrant rights. They care about, you know, what's happening for people of color, what's happening for, for you know, 
around the world, the realities of immigration. So I, I just want to say that I have a great belief and I support as many young people as possible by mentoring, by, by helping them. I feel like 10% of my day is spent, you know, giving encouragement to a younger generation because I, I see in them a positive future. One thing I would say is that, and I think you alluded to this, um, the person who asked the question is that the influence, can you hear? Can you hear now? Okay. I, I was saying that the one thing I would allude to or that you alluded to in your question is that the, the influence of media is, ex the landscape is extremely different to what it was even five years ago. And so uh, a CBC or a CNN or, you know, you name it, has far less and more diffuse in, uh, influence than it would have five or 10 or 20 years ago because now there are so many sources. I'm a strong believer in the necessity of having as many sources as possible and to have information freely available for people to be able to make up their minds and, and to garner information the way they want. But it is concerning that it could, that it does take, and we've seen evidence of this in several countries, just a few um, well-targeted, micro-targeted ads on Facebook and a few fake Twitter and Facebook accounts to spread the uh, fake news and to possibly influence the outcome of an election. And so that shows that there is a new kind of influence, which you've all heard about, that we need to be concerned about. But I think overall, the, the general outcome, when you have this many voices, this many uh, ways of airing an issue can only be positive. That's my view. I thought I saw a hand, yeah, about halfway back on this side. You got one here? Okay, we'll take this one and we'll come to you in a minute. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to see three women on a panel for global citizenship. And uh, my question is definitely about women uh, becoming global citizens. And I'm trying to be, and right now, discovering a lot of challenges on that path. So from your experience, uh, what is the, what, it, what, what you would give as a kind of a tip to women who aspire to go beyond borders and really like uh, make a mark on international forums? So from your experience, your challenges and how you have dealt with those challenges, if you can give some advice. So well, if, with all due respect to everybody else in the room, I think if there's an expert on this subject, it's the person who asked the question, um, who's Anamika, uh, I just, I'm very bad at pronunciation, and Wisha, who I mentioned in my comments. But to give my own two cents um, on the topic is that I found that the best way of maybe sidestepping the issue or moving beyond the issue of being a woman as opposed to a man in my world or my um, line of business is not to think about it at all. And people say that's a cop-out. People say that um, uh, perhaps not giving ourselves credit as women at having a different approach or being uh, add, adding value to an approach. But I think for me in my business, it, I had to leave it aside. And the one place that it actually has been useful to me is when I interact with other women, because I find it's easier to access women and their stories as a woman. But in terms of just navigating the world, I'd like to be treated and I'd like to work just like anybody else. That's the way I've dealt with it. It's a really, really good question. And as you're asking it, I feel like I have no idea how to answer it other than when I think about Indigenous movements in Canada, when I think about my participation at the International Indigenous Movement and the various communities that I've worked with, women are always at the forefront of it. And I feel like I don't know how to answer that and I don't know how or why and I could say something like, you know, about the strength of women or the leadership of women, but um, I, I just see that women are taking those leadership roles and, and they're not always in the public forefront, 
right? So they may not be the spokesperson of the movement or what have you, but they're always leading the movement. They're doing the groundwork, doing the organization um, and doing the real work. And I think that sort of maybe been my approach is just put your head down, do the work and, and try to get it done. And I don't need, you know, spend a lot of time in the media. I don't tend to do a lot of interviews. I just sort of, my goal has always just been put my head down and, and do the work and try to make the change. I don't know if that's, it's a really good question though. Yeah. It, is, it is a great question. Um, I'd echo these comments. I feel also finding people who will support, mentor, give you a path. I've had an enormous benefit of having 27 years of great mentors, many in this room. And frankly, um, that Nike saying, just do it, I, I believe that. I mean, I, I learned early on, it's much easier to apologize than ask for forgive and ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. I'm the queen of just doing it. And someone says, wow, you really were bold. And I'm like, yeah, I did it. Was it wrong? You know, should I not have? So I really feel you, there is a lot of, um, we have self-inflicted uh, worry and self-doubt and women, fr frankly, you know, we have the burden of that, of being told, unfortunately, at many times you can't do this. And I just feel, do it and, you know, ask for the forgiveness later. Um, and working with like-minded people, it's, it's important to work outside of your comfort zone and I've done both. But when I started to work with, and, and I work only rarely now with him, with Robert Redford, but when he first, we started working together and he hired me, he said, I love Canadians, you look north, you look up. You look to the sky, you don't look at your feet. And I think that's an interesting thing. It's looking up, looking forward, moving forward, progressing. And, and it's easy to look back and go, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. No one has time for that. It's all about forward motion. I think if we just remember that and be more forgiving of ourselves. Thank you. Okay, right here. Yeah, okay. Hi. Uh, set aside, if you can, your work and what your immediate concerns and worries are. Just as people, when you go to bed at night, what does each of you think the most pressing global problem is? Climate change. Sorry. Climate change. That keeps me up. Lack of resources, shortages, water that we all have to share around the world, that I've thought about that deep into the night. I feel like some nights, a lot of nights it's climate change and a lot of nights it's violence in a very broad sense, in a very sort of personal, uh, real sense in the community that we live in and in the world. But, yeah. um, hate, violence, climate change, all three. I also think of things like, is my cat gonna land on my head at 4 a.m. and wake me up from my limited sleep? That's a worry. Like, it's very important to have a safe cocoon, I always say, so wherever we are in the world, and these are incredibly prominent and women doing great work and a president of university, it's also important to take a moment where you have a safe cocoon and, you know, at night, shut everything off and just, like, rejuvenate, resuscitate, and, and spiritually organize yourself so that the next day you wake up and start again. Um, so I also think I worry about many things at 2.30 in the morning, <laughs> thus my Twitter addiction, but I also really try, there are moments of joy every day. I, you celebrate the small things and, and when they happen, and they happen every day for I'm sure the majority of us, you take a moment to say, that was great. That was achievement, that was prog pro progression. And I think that is also, I'm trying to do that more so that I don't, you know, spiral down into a vortex. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take the question at the back. I was glad to hear that last, one of the last questions there, uh, because my concerns is, uh, what kind of conditions will my granddaughter live under in the, as, a, as a citizen of the world uh, in by 2050 or so? And uh, I was very, I start working for parks about 50 years ago and uh, had a, a wonderful career 
but it made me very sensitive to the kind of landscapes I worked in. So uh, I was reading material lately about the middle class collectively being about 1 billion people with a... Now, can you imagine the amount of consumption that that is going to entail? Uh, uh, things that go along with that is that we have overfished the fisheries of the oceans, many of the species by 90%. Uh, our acidification has changed the algae, reduced algae in the oceans by 40%, and algae were responsible for producing 50% of the world's oxygen. And uh, recently it came out by uh, World Wildlife Fund that uh, our wildlife dropped by 60%. Another comment on it was that we will lose one half, 50% of all, all wildlife on the earth, or of the species on the earth. Uh, there on the Bathurst caribou herd, there used to be a herd of 400,000 animals. There are now 18,000 animals. Uh, Lake Winnipeg, I watched over a couple of decades as the algae creeped over the whole of the lake and it's pretty much a disaster now, much like Lake Erie. So uh, the last one I heard was a report from a Dr. Pimentel from Cornell University. And he said that the world is heading towards starvation by 2050, that there will be global, global wide starvation. And I can recall a few decades ago when there was a world emergency, that there were supplies to feed the, uh, refugees for at least two years. Present time, there is no longer adequate to, to feed refugees for any time at all. All of the refugee camps are shortage of food and they're turning people away. So my question to you is, uh, you know, we only have human rights and the citizens of the world only have human rights. So as long as the world that we live in provides. Now, uh, could you tell me what you expect human rights to be by 2050 for citizens of the world? including mm. my own grandchildren. That's, that seems pretty easy, yeah. Well, I, I'm really glad you raised it because we, we I think he's adding something. A blog called climatedisaster.com. <laughs> I think it's, it's great that you've raised it because as you probably know, this year marks the 70th year since the Human Rights Declaration was, was signed. And I think most of you would agree, or some of you might agree that, um, Human rights are not uh, perhaps observed as well as they were 10, 15, or 20 years ago. With the rise of populist governments and with um, the conveniences necessary to keep certain relationships with certain countries, that there are rights being ignored in certain places in, uh, in the world, including Africa and the Middle East. And obviously, we should be concerned about human rights in other places because they have a direct effect on the rest of the world. Not only because human rights are human rights, obviously everybody are, is affected if there are rights being violated elsewhere, but because they also directly affect, as you said, um, human movement. It drives people away if they're persecuted, not treated the way they should be. Um, relatives in other countries are concerned because of what happens to their people abroad. How governments deal with each other is driven or not driven enough by how human rights are being observed in certain countries. So currently, I worry personally about the state of, of human rights and where it's heading from here, again, given that it's been 70 years. It's not a very long time. No? Um, the only thing I would maybe add, <laughs> which isn't necessarily a direct answer to the question, so my apologies, but it did make me think back to our question about the power of one and my own challenge of thinking about how do we mobilize individual action for these larger collective issues. And I think one of the things that I was reading recently was talking about how, you no, know, if I if I don't drink bottled water, or if I just, you know, use my car less, it may not actually change or have the impact to address climate change. But what this uh, scientist or psychologist, I think it was, was saying is what it does do is it motivates people. It gets people engaged on the issue, gets people started to be more educated, to then start making different choices in politics. And so 
these individual actions may not be enough to sort of address these big issues like climate change, but they can be really important because they empower individuals to take action and then to get involved in broader systemic change. And so I think um, I try to be very hopeful that we are in a world where human rights are increasingly being recognized. And even in the area of climate change, it was a huge success that many of the advocates were able to get our climate change, uh, our international framework for climate change to include human rights. So it's not just about the science anymore. It's actually thinking about how does climate change impact people? And so I actually think we have a growing recognition of the role of human rights and the importance of human rights, and it's starting to become front and center in more issues. So I do hope that we'll see greater recognition. Yep, down on the side, yep. Naya, I've watched you since I came to Canada. I love your shows. But this is a question on safety. So you've traveled to many war-torn countries. And um, as a journalist, have you felt unsafe as a, f a female in some of these countries that are dangerous? Um, thank you for the question. I, I'll make it very brief just so we can um, keep it on sort of on more directly the topic at, at hand. But yes, there have been many places where I felt unsafe. And yes, I've been very scared in many places. But we are doing a lot more now in security than we used to do. So a lot more preparation, a lot more risk assessment, and a lot more help from people on the ground. So it, that helps a lot. But thank you for watching us, too. Thank you. We'll go here. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Isi. I born uh, in Ethiopia, but I'm Somali ethic. I born in Ethiopia as Ethiopian, however, I'm, I don't believe I'm Ethiopian because during the colonization, you know, they were divided. So I was divided into five parts. Now Djibouti became part of it. And the other, only two of Somali became independent. Somali, British, Somali, Italia. The other Somali, British, British gave one to um, Kenya and the other parties gave to uh, Ethiopia. And I born while we were getting killed because Ethiopian you know, government doesn't recognize us as a citizens. They recognize us as a pirates. 1977, a war happened when I was young. I lost my education. Luckily, um, 1990, I got a, a chance um, to come to uh, here. Um, the reason I came here because of my mother. My mother tried to feed me whatever food she has, you know. And when I was coming here, it was like all the beads fly away except the um, chicken to be slaughtered. Somalia was, everybody was killing to each other. I was like one to leave Somalia before the Civil War. Luckily, when I came here, I sponsored my two children. They reunited with me in Canada, 1993. Uh, Three of my children, two of them graduated. One, um, commercial farming. He works now in Alberta. Uh, then her daughter, Anissa Issa, she's doing now a master here. Recently, she came from Nova Scotia, presenting, um, you know, immigrants um, and health. She's doing that project. I think some of the professor here, she knows, and the students. I have another son, Abdullah Issa, who's doing engineering. I'm the last, I mean, the um, the, the father who get that opportunity to come here and raise his children in Canada. But there's a lot of Africans like, you know, like me, who didn't get the opportunity I came to here. Thanks very much to Canada helping us, you know, immigrants. But in the same token, I think in the universities and global citizens like you, you can advocate. On Africa, now we see future. Bees coming, but that bees needs to be helped. You know, so we need, we have resource, we have gold, we have fish, you name any resource. But the problem is few people only take all that and with the help of Western, you know, uh, companies. 
So please, I want in Al-Ayat, you advocate for peace in whole Africa. Thank you very much. I, I think everybody here would advocate for peace in Africa and the whole world. But I will say one other thing is that I said that climate change keeps me up at night, but I think some of you who watch CBC know that the other big thing that keeps me up at night is the massive displacement of people around the world and how the world's going to respond. And without obviously getting into detail about the caravan that's happening south of the border, as you mentioned at the beginning, we're talking about nearly 17 million people who are on the move right now as we speak, and 25 million of them displaced because of conflict, persecution, or poverty. And in Europe, um, fences are going up. And countries are working across with Africa, with African countries, to try to prevent people from making the, the journey over to Europe. And so this is a massive question. And it's not for one government, it's not for any government, it's for the whole world to, to, to tackle. And it's not a problem that's going away. So it's a very good issue to bring up and it's something we should all be thinking about. Just, just a personal comment. I, when, when you were talking earlier about what, uh, what might keep you awake at night, uh, if I had answered that question, I would have said the inequitable distribution of wealth because I think so many of these other issues, these inter issues are interconnected and the, the, the lust for accumulation in some parts of the world uh, at the expense of, of other parts of the world and other people is just inherently, it seems to me, unstable. Uh, I'll go to my colleague at the back. Let's hope this mic works. Um, I'm not a man, I don't have a certain pigment of skin, I'm not a Canadian, um, and I'm not of a certain age, and, and what I'm getting at is, uh, I'm not sure many of you have heard this before, identity politics concerns me. Um, it seems to be central to debates and to talks like this all the time. By definition, um, identity politics separates us. Um, it is propelled by promoting the concept of diversity. Um, should we not prioritize our common humanity and then enjoy diversity as a, an important but secondary characteristic? We all love and hate and, and bleed, and so common humanity is, is something I hear from Steven Pinker, Sam Harris, and, and, and David Friedman from the New York Times fleetingly, but often I hear about diversity. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's secondary. In my estimation, I like to hear more of our common humanity. We talk about globalization, and when we say that, in part, we're talking about our common humanity. So I wish we, we, could, we could talk more about how we are the same, and then talk about at least in Winnipeg, we talk about Fulkarama, then talk about Fulkarama, then talk about our differences, which are so wonderful and interesting. So a comment about this idea, um, I think Nella uh, um, um, more than implied it when she talked about not being a woman so much, if I heard her correctly, and there was a, a slight clapping from the audience, but she implied that, you know, I'm a reporter first or something of that nature, rather than a woman first. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to correct the record that I did not say that I'm not a woman. <laughs> just, just make that very clear. Um, but my question to you would be, why, why, the, can't, why do the two have to be mutually exclusive? That's my question. Why can we not all be common and, and, be, and celebrate our sameness while also celebrating our diversity? I personally, having grown up with that as an ethos, I don't see how the two are, are extricable. Folks, we'll take one more question. Sorry. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I yes. Actually, I want to answer that because um, I, I, it's a concern that I hear frequently. And my only response is if we focus on sameness, we may miss all the inequality that exists that needs to be addressed. And I, for one, and my family has had a very lived experience that might be quite different from a lot of people in this audience. And if 
I am afraid that if we focus on saveness, what we lose is my experience and some of the changes that need to be made in society in order for me to have me and my family to have the same outcomes that a lot of people in this room have had. I'm very fortunate. Okay, good. Just a second. Sorry, sorry. I just want to say one thing about common humanity. I, and pardon me, we'll let you talk. I, I, unfortunately, I think the definition of humanity, um, depending on who you are, and I'm not saying about th this about anyone in this room, but I think unfortunately there has there has been um, a reinterpretation of that for personal goal. So frankly, I think we even have to define what it means because too many corrupt leaders have have twisted it. To, to keep it as an individualism versus a collective and common humanity. So I think it's important to have the distinctions. Last question. Okay. okay. My name is uh, Dr. Peter Karari. I am an alumni of the this University from the Other Moral Center of Peace and Justice. And uh, I was the very first recipient of the Nella Ayed Prize in 2010. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am currently a lecturer at the Karatina University in Kenya, which has a memorandum of understanding with the University of uh, Manitoba. And uh, when I think about global citizenship, I focus more on the forces that are against global citizenship. Forces like discrimination, inequality, iniquity, uh, lack of accessibility, and so on. Uh, there's an international student who was here between 2009 and 2015. I felt sometimes uh, not like uh, a citizen uh, in quotes of the University of Manitoba because I paid the international student school fees because I was not covered by Manitoba Health. Yeah. And we worked so hard to ensure that we are recognized. But many times we felt like we are outsiders. So I am not sure whether the situation is the same. I heard the other day that the Manitoba Health is uh, going to be removed from the international students. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, my question goes to Dr. Bernard. Uh, what are, what are the steps or the initiatives that the University of Manitoba is taking to ensure that global citizenship is experienced at this particular institution? Because global citizenship has to start with us here before we move forward. Thank you. Thanks for that. I'll answer it briefly because it's not our topic tonight, really, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, and we're coming to the end of the hour. You're right that there are differences. Some of those are imposed on us from outside, uh, and we certainly try as a university to minimize them. I would say that the university's perspective on global citizenship is that having people like you, who came to uh, to the university from other places, helps us as Canadians to better understand the international milieu and our efforts to encourage our own students to go abroad, uh, some with the prospect of coming home and some not, uh, also encourages the, the, uh, uh, an openness to understanding how people live in different parts of the world and to encouraging global citizenship. If it were in my power to do so, I would love to see every student who comes to the University of Manitoba spend at least one semester abroad in order to have the broadening of life experience that many of us in this world, in this room, have had. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's it's not accept, it's not available to everyone. I wish it were. But I thank you for for putting your uh, your finger on something that I think is very important to us, and we're trying to uh, increase the flow of people in both directions and to, as far as we are able to contain it, to, to control the costs of these things to make them acceptable for everyone who's moving in one direction or another. But thanks for giving me the opportunity to answer a question. Uh, that brings us, folks, to the end of the evening. It's 8.30. I really want to say uh, 
thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, it's it's been uh, for the the size of the crowd the 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 clear uh, sense that everyone in the audience is paying attention to what's being said uh, is, uh, is easily seen from here at the front of the room. Appreciate your being here, appreciate your, uh, your participation, the willingness to uh, participate in the, in the questions. Uh, I don't think I can say enough to thank the panelists. Uh, they were indeed. We're proud of all of our University of, of Manitoba alumni, but when we get a chance to have uh, some of them back and contribute the, the wisdom and the experience of, uh, uh, of what they've been doing since they left here as students, someone who hasn't actually left, <laughs> but stopped being a student, uh, it's actually, it's really wonderful. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're so proud to be able to have this experience. I know that many of you will want to, uh, to try and have conversations with, uh, with our guests, uh, with the panelists, and uh, I wish you good luck in that. <laughs> there, there's a lot of you. And again, let me say thank you for coming. The, this series of, uh, of events for the last several years has been an important part of what we do at the University of Manitoba. We appreciate the support. Keep coming, and thank you. Really, I can't say enough to thank you.